So this is kind of a response video to two people. Um, there's Growling Griffin when we're dealing with the issue of health versus sickness, which was how um, good and evil were reduced. In other words, I said, I'm not really sure that I believe in good and evil, and he said, okay, I, I, I understand that objection, so let's look at it this way. Let's say health versus sickness, or healthy acts, healthy emotions versus sick ones, or sick acts, or sick feelings, or whatever. And I said originally, okay, we can tell whether or not um, something is unhealthy. It seems to look pretty obvious when somebody has leprosy, or um, sometimes it's not so obvious, and perhaps when somebody's in catatonic depression, which I have experienced, <laughs> um, you just kind of look like you're laying there listlessly doing nothing and not interested in anything, whereas you know, you're pretty close to experiencing hell on earth, I think, in that kind of a state. It's like, say, if you'd gone through a long period of acute anxiety. Um, <clears throat> now, in that vein, let's say that this might... Let's, let's test this theory, though. Let's say somebody is in a state of catatonic depression. Nothing will get them out of that, let's say. They're stuck there. Um, or at least it lasts long enough to impact their personality in more or less a permanent way. I think this too has happened to me. Um, about 25, 30 years ago, closer to 25, I think, I went through <coughs> a depression that was so severe I couldn't rise out of bed on days. I found it difficult to walk. Um, basically, caffeine kept me animated. I had no energy at all. I guess, spiritually speaking, one would say that I had fallen prey to acute acedia, the noonday demon, as it is called, where you don't just have physical lethargy, you have psychological, mental, emotional lethargy and sluggishness and, at the same time, chaos up here. You can't make any decisions at all concerning anything, but you're beset by a zillion decisions that have to be made at all time. All of them probably are going to have disastrous out outcomes, but you still have to decide. It's, you know, just imagine what acute depression is like. Um, <clears throat> I've often said as well, though, that I've benefited from feeling that way for that period of my life. Why? Well, I learned all kinds of things about myself and about life while all this was happening. Um, I began to question absolutely everything. I started to engage in ex existential musings as a result of that. And these existential musings have borne fruit over time. I find that I agree with Socrates. The unexamined life is not worth living. That's one way of saying that most people's lives are not worth living, but again, if they're not examining their lives, they don't know that they're living lives that aren't worth living. But if you examine your life and you find that it is not worth living, okay, then you get busy living or get busy dying. And depression forced me to self-examine. And all the skills that I learned when I, I guess, thought my way out of depression came in very handy later in life when life started to throw all the curves that it throws at us. If it doesn't kill you, it makes it makes you stronger. I wasn't killed by depression. It strengthened me. It's left its marks on me, of course. As I say, my emotions are a little bit out of whack. I can't cry. I haven't cried in 30 years. I can't feel extreme sadness or anything like that. It just doesn't happen. A lot of people who have gotten to know me over the years on YouTube see that I'm quite an aloof person, even though I don't want to be. That, too, seems to be a result of this. But my life, actually, has not been destroyed. I have handicaps, I guess you would call it, as a result of this, scars. But the benefits seem to outweigh this. <clears throat> I now am strong enough to deal with things that I see other people are destroyed by. My workplace just shut down and a lot of us have to go find work elsewhere inside the same company, by the way. Um, we're unionized, so we have job protection guarantees. But 
somebody my age, 52, having to switch careers after 30 years or even just switch career types within the same company, if you've been doing the same thing for 30 years and suddenly you have to radically change everything, I see people destroyed by this. With me, it's a minor blip on my radar. I, I go, okay, I, I can adapt to this because I've learned to adapt. Depression taught me to adapt to my surroundings. So I look at people and part of me even sort of inwardly sniggers at them saying, this is all it takes for you to get to have your life completely derailed. Wow, I don't understand that. Uh, they have my sympathy, they have my pity even, but I don't get it. I see somebody who would let themselves get lulled into a sense of complacency by life by assuming that because it's all roses now, it I have the right for things to be roses at all time, at all times. That's, you know, falling for it all, I guess, getting complacent in life. I learned the hard way, the extreme dangers of complacency and allowing yourself to coast as it were in life. I don't do that anymore. I live consciously now. A lot of people say that I overthink everything. Well, okay. I either overthink things or I run the risk of complacency. And then nemesis is just around the corner, right? But now when nemesis comes at me, I go, aha, uh -huh, I was wondering when you were going to come back. And as a result, I'm ready to face Nemesis when he or she shows his or her ugly face. I go, yep, here it comes. I knew this was coming. I knew that this is the kind of world I lived in. So I'm ready. <clears throat> so sickness isn't just sickness. We don't know what its ultimate value is. I was strengthened by something that seems to have absolutely no redeeming characteristics severe depression. Overall, in the entire canvas that is my life, I seem to have been helped by this horrific condition. Um, other people are destroyed by minor blips in their job life. They're, they're too old to adapt at, when they're at the same age as I am. Why? Too many years of coasting. Depression said, don't bloody coast. <laughs> <clears throat> now, to keep going in this vein, I said, I, the original question was, what is health? You kind of batted the question aside, growling Griffin. I'm going to persist in this. I want you to tell me what health is. Um... I've already stated that I'm, I'm saying that we don't necessarily know what sickness is. Mystic of the Sands in the comments section really strongly picked up on that theme. What is corruption? What is illness? What is filth? What is foulness? What is pollution? Well, okay, we can say that pollution is bad for us. Maybe. Can it be good for us? Maybe. A volcano erupts, spouting horrific gases into, toxic gases into the atmosphere, uh, suffocating heaven knows how many sentient organisms who die a terrible death, gasping for air. Um... Vesuvius covers Pompeii and Herculano, Herculaneum with ash and all the people in it slowly die of despair and poisonous fumes or maybe they're killed by falling rocks falling from the sky <clears throat> and yet look what happens the volcanic ash creates a very fertile soil um the ancient Romans who died in Pompeii and Herculaneum died in very unfortunate circumstances, horrible circumstances. But look what they've left us. As a result of their, if you want to call it sacrifice, we now know far more about them. 
in a sense, we know more about the people who were killed in Herculaneum or Pompeii than we do about just about any other Roman, even more so than Julius Caesar, because we can see how these people lived their everyday lives. We can see the utensils that they ate from. We can see where they were in their houses when they died. We can piece their lives together. We can take the remains of their bodies, find out exactly what they looked like. I wonder what we're going to do when we finally um, figure out how to um, read DNA with, from our perspective today, 100% accuracy. We can rebuild all the people that died in, in, in Pompeii and Herculaneum and say, this person now lives. Fame, I guess, in a certain way. They got something out of their horrible deaths. I don't know. <clears throat> it's never as cut and dried when it comes to the negatives. Same with the positives, the enhancements. What is an enhancement? What is health? What is vitality? What is happiness? What is joy? What are all these positive things? What is meaningful? What is good? Not so easily answered, which is why I say when you are dealing with things in that dichotomous sort of way when you're dealing with polarities whatever you want to call it the positive polarity is very difficult to pin down and you know I say what is good well good is feeding people who are hungry good is curing diseases no no that's just eliminating bad what's good there are people out there that will say there is no good all right that's nice you're gonna to have to demonstrate that there's evidence of absence absence of evidence that sort of thing. Argument from ignorance, whatever you want to call that. You might say that there's no absolutely good thing, no problem. There's, I would counter that with there is no absolutely bad thing. There's no um, absolutely healthy act. There's no absolutely unhealthy act. You have too much health, suddenly you've got too, mu too many people. More than the planet can sustain. Okay. So health itself might not be a good thing, right? In certain ways. <clears throat> As I say, I'm going to be kind of relentless on that. What is health? If we're going to deal with things like health and sickness, tell me what health is. Which brings me to a comment that was left on my video where, uh, where somebody had asked me, what is, um, or do you have any links or whatever for Syadvada. Now Syadvada is the sevenfold theory of maybe, or I guess it's the theory of in some ways. Um, is it a theory? I don't know. I would say that it's um, more of a tool than anything else, as is Anakandavada, which my channel is named after, my nick. It's not a way of believing anything. It's a way of training your mind to work. Um, it's a tool. It's a prism to look through as opposed to something to believe is existent. Syadvada is just you take any posit, any proposition, any proposed idea, fact, whatever, any statement, any claim, and you put it through the sevenfold theory of maybe. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, maybe it is and isn't, maybe it's indescribable, etc. Or in some ways it is, in some ways it isn't, in some ways it is and isn't, or yada, yada, yada. You keep going for anything. Now, the Stoics were all about habit forming. You can form good or bad habits, right? Um, what, what just starts to come naturally to you when you sort of do things without puzzling everything out, you've, you know, what, how you react to things in life is something you can train yourself to do, per the Stoics. You can develop the habit of examining things. You can develop the habit of looking at things from as many different points of view as possible. You can develop the habit of trying to find the truth and the falsehood in every possible statement. And what it does is, instead of leading to a position of solipsism, 
it leads to a loosened, sort of more flexible view of reality. You learn to skip your perspective around. You learn to sort of look at things and say, what's good about depression? Well, there can't be anything good about depression. Well, I just explained how one could actually make a case that depression has benefited me. A severe depression. Um, you know, you can make any kind of case for that. For anything that, you know, like what... Uh, how, how far do you want to push that that idea that there's a silver lining in every cloud? You know, our society deals in absolutes. But you start talking about silver linings in clouds like the Holocaust, and people start to really look at you a funny way. They start to find you disturbing. Perhaps you're evil. Perhaps they just don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. Maybe they want the cops to come and knock on your door. But <clears throat> who said that the truth is for the faint of heart? I agree with Zopfi, and I agree with all kinds of other people who have suggested that the truth, if you, if, it, if you perceive the truth and you're not ready for it, it can kill you. Um, or, it, or it could drive you insane. Possibly, yes, it might. So keep your absolute thinking if you're not ready to let go of that life raft, which in my opinion it is a life raft, or a life preserver, or a crutch, or whatever you want to call it. A lot of people say, well, we, we have to have absolutes, otherwise we have no certainty at all. I don't really see that that's an argument in favor of the existence of certainty. So, like, we require certainty as human beings, or we'll go insane. Therefore, certainty must be assumed to exist. The universe owes us no ease of comprehension. I like uh, Galileo's response to, I think it was the Pope or some Cardinal or whatever, when he was forced to recant his view that we live in a heliocentric uh, solar system, not a terracentric solar system. He said, yes, okay, I get it, I'll sign the thing that says I recant what I'm saying when I say that the Earth revolves around the Sun. He signs the thing saying, I, Galileo Galilei, solemnly declare that the sun revolves around the earth. Then he muttered under his breath, E pur si muove, and yet it moves. Our requirement for certainties, or our apparent requirement for anchors, doesn't mean that therefore these anchors exist or that these certainties exist. Um, if you don't like the fact that this is going in a disturbing direction, okay, don't go any further. If you don't want to leave the Garden of Eden, don't eat the forbidden fruit. I, and I mean that. If, you don't, if, if you're fine in Plato's cave, because at least Plato's cave has some sort of certainty to it, then stay in there. By all means, I have no desire to disabuse what I guess I could arrogantly call simple-minded people of their simple-mindedness. How is it going to benefit them from, from discovering that everything that they believed is not as solid as they thought? Unless, of course, like me, you sort of say, well, it's better to know the way things are rather than live in ignorance in all cases. I would say in most cases it's, from my perspective, it's better to know the things the way they are. But, you know, who knows? Do we really want to read the future? Do we want to know what's going to happen? I don't know. It's an interesting question that's been around since Homer. Cassandra knew the future. Nobody believed her. <laughs> How's that for a hellish existence? So in some ways it is good to know the future, in some ways it wouldn't be, in some ways it is and it isn't good to know the future, in some ways we don't know if it's going to be good to know the future, because then there's the future after the future. Time just keeps going. <coughs> That's Syadvada. It's quite straightforward and simple, and it's explained in Wikipedia, I find, fairly effectively under the title of Anekantavada. 
what is tricky about Syadvada is learning to train your mind over time to develop into a habit of seeing things that way. That takes a lot more work. And in fact, it may the only thing that is there is work to get your mind to work in a certain way. Constantly attempt to change the way you perceive things. Uh, it requires effort. It requires repetition, which is why, even though I'm a complete skeptic and I don't believe in God or anything like that, I'm still something of a mystic. Um, because training one's mind to see things a certain way often looks like you're engaging in religion. Um, especially when, like me, you're not afraid of using religious symbols and religious texts and this sort of thing. I have no problem with any of that. I don't feel like <clears throat> I need to um, inoculate myself against religion because if I use too much religious tes tes texts or, or thought or anything like that, it's somehow going to infect me with religion. If anything, I seem to be kind of the opposite. The more I delve into all aspects of faith and scripture and all that kind of thing, the less likely I am to fall for it because there's sort of a confirmation bias that takes place here where I'm, I go looking for evidence that my skepticism is justified and I find that by reading the Quran, by reading uh, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, the Bible. I say this stuff all refers to things that can be read obliquely. And I guess in many ways I have Syadvada to thank for that because rather than just sort of as a lot of modern atheists do say this is all religion is just horse feathers it's just garbage that has no redeeming reality to it at all because none of it's true I tend to sort of say well on some some levels it might be true if read a certain way if read allegorically if read parabolically i.e. parables where you're not really supposed to actually take the literal meaning of what something is. You're supposed to come at it parabolically at a strange oblique angle and you get a parable and the literal details of the story aren't what's important. The, what's important is the overall point of it all. Um, you know, the parable of the Good Samaritan. It doesn't matter if the Good Samaritan existed or didn't exist. It's irrelevant. It's just a little treatise against being a little bit too categorical in the way that you judge people. That has validity. But because it's written in the Bible, do I have to say that it's all rubbish? No. And Syadvada, teaching yourself to think that way, can actually help you falling into that trap of saying that this idea is just garbage because it's based on something which I believe is fundamentally wrong, which is a mythological, semi-supernatural view of reality, which I don't have. Um, I'm a deep skeptic, not because I'm by conviction a skeptic, it's just that seems to be the way my mind works. I want to see, is this true? And I want to put everything through the ringer, relentless ringer, to find out whether or not something is true. Not for the ultimate aim of disproving everything, because that's not my aim, but the aim of determining where the truth lies. Syadvada, in many ways, has allowed me to apprehend truths that exist on certain levels that may not exist on other levels. Sorry, my phone has started to ring, but at this point I think I'm done the video. Health and Syadvada.